With the upcoming expansion, Federation's coming into our general direction like a freight train that doesn't have any brakes. It's time to take a look a little bit deeper to some of the Federations that you will be able to construct within this new expansion. Of course, there's Origins, there is the Juggernaut, there's the Galactic Community, but Federations is what we're going to be focused on for today. All those other items will come at some time in the future. Now, Federations so far have been very, very lackluster, at least since launch. We have the current Alliance system, which is very shallow. Uh, empires join a group, they donate their fleet power to an alliance fleet, there is a leader, those alliance fleets obviously can be very powerful, but aside that there is no unified rule system or laws that really bring them together as a group of species that have decided to shake each other's hands. Now with federations this is going to completely change. First of all we have five different types and they're completely open to modding as well so feel free to go into the workshop once the expansion comes out and be like, hey, I want to get this one, I want to take that one, I want to put that one in my game. Anyway, from the base game, or at least from the expansion onwards, we're going to have five, which is the Galactic Union, the Trade League, the Research Cooperative, the Martial Alliance, and the Head Genemy. Now, all of these have their own mechanics, and we're going to be talking about these today and how they actually work. First of all, they all have unique passive bonuses, and joining a federation will cost you two influence a month, which is a pretty big hit, especially early game, because you want to get those influence points to keep expanding. You're going to need to get the right relics. You're going to need to get the right resources. You're going to need to be able to handle your factions properly to get the right amount of influence to actually be able to participate in the, in the alliance. And that's something that we're going to be talking about in another video because factions in their current shape are not all that great. Anyway, joining a federation will also increase the trust value to other members slowly over time with a trust value of 50 uh, when it gets at its peak. So it takes like 50 months to get max trust with all the other federation members. Now, certain federations are also locked behind different type of ethics and government forms, but anybody can join any federation. Now, obviously, this does not include total war uh, CB nations like Fanatic Purifiers, Eliminators, but Barbaric Despoilers and Criminal Syndicates can totally join a federation. And that right there makes them slightly less garbage. <laughs> let's, let's put it that way. So yeah, they can join in on the fun, so that's that's positive. I'm pretty sure Barbaric Despoilers are still going to be terrible afterwards, but hey, that's, that's like a whole different discussion for a whole different time. Anyway, Different federations have serving are serving different purposes, and they got different functions as well. First of all, the basic alliance, the one that you're going to get in your vanilla game, because yes, there's going to be a free patch, but only one type of alliance will be available for free, which is the Galactic Union. It's the most basic of the bunch, uh, like I said, part of the free update, and is a more advanced version of what you currently get. So it's the current alliance system. With a few buffs thrown in, and it can that can grow over time. We'll, we'll talk about the growing system and the quote unquote leveling up of alliance very shortly. It's the most basic one. We don't know what any of the traits are. We don't know uh, what kind of passive bonuses they have, etc. Now let's talk about the other four. The four that have well that come with the, with the expansion itself. First of all, the military alliance is all about improving member combat abilities and fleet power. In the end, you know, in the end, what does the game really revolve around, right? It is about being able to project your power across space. At least that it is from my perspective. The entire gameplay loop really focuses on the fleet in the long term. However, with the Military Alliance, you will get better ship build speed, you will get better veterancy on your ships and your armies, because clearly that super obscure system is still a thing. Yes, for those people that are still building fleet academies on your station, it, it's 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 still a thing. It, it, it does... Yeah, veterancy. It's not very clear that it exists and that it is a thing, but we'll be talking about that one another time. Anyway, um, federations, it's a federation you want to join if you want to field badass fleets, which is fairly straightforward. And, you know, you want to fight for over dominance over the over the galaxy. Now, the first real thing is, is that only militarists have the option to form this type of alliance. After that, anybody can join. So it's kind of important to note. Then we have the research 
Cooperative. Now, Research Cooperative, surprise, surprise, is all about the science. Uh, members, they earn bonuses to science production over time. They start off with a free research agreement between all members. For those of you who don't know what is a research agreement and how it all works, if you have a research agreement with another empire, any research that you research, that's a lot of research in one sentence, at the same time as somebody else does or they've already done it, you will get a 25% bonus to research speed. So let's say that you're researching zero point power, the empire that you already have the uh, research agreement with already has that, you get a 25% bonus to research your version of zero point power so you will get that for free normally it will cost influence but obviously considering you're already paying to influence a tick for stuff uh, being member of that alliance it makes sense that research agreements uh, uh, are for free here because you know paying out of the nose and influences nobody uh, nobody's particularly happy with that uh, you can only start it if you're a materialist which makes perfect sense there's no real note whether or not you need to be fanatic materialist or just a materialist so this is something we want to keep in mind still though it's uh it's it's kind of cool to see uh, obviously we're gonna get bonus over time most likely towards science and stuff like that but we'll see how that all pans out then there's the trade leaks there are trade leaks what, what more can you really say uh, if you want to roll in endless amounts of cash then this is pretty much the place to go and um looking at the uh examples that we've had so far is that from my point of view, trade leagues are arguably some of the most powerful uh, types of federations you can set up and join. Like, seriously. They have a very special mechanic or a very special modifier that takes wealth creation, consumer good benefits, and the marketplace of ideas, which are the trade policies, throw them out of the window, merges them all into one item called trade league policy and this insanely powerful trade policy will give you one energy 0 0.25 unity and 0 0.5 consumer goods per trade value let's let that sink in for a second if you have high enough trade value you will never need to build any consumer good factories that is insane that is crazy you can rush through that tradition tree no problem whatsoever trade leagues are so powerful on paper and i love it it will make mega corp so much more interesting if you have the expansion uh only mega corps can start this alliance unless you have the merchant guild civic which is only available if you don't own mega corp and uh, yeah it's on paper it's just so good it is just so good why would you do anything else but become a trade league it's wow it's it's such a boost for Megacorp as an expansion. It, it, I'm so happy that it's getting some love because Megacorp to me, <sighs> the mega structures were fun, the mega structures were nice, but the empire type of Megacorp is it's it just doesn't do anything to me. It's it it does not tickle me in the right place. Uh, let's see what else we got here. The Heat Genemy. Okay, so the Genemy Genemy is a little bit weird. So, all the other alliances and all the other federations are all about being able to cooperate as a group and becoming more powerful over time. This one, however, is an alliance led by a single strong empire with several weak empires to kind of sort of buffer it, kind of think the Soviet Union with a bunch of buffer states that are with you. It, it, basically, the lead empire gets a whole slew of bonuses, and any other empire that is part of the federation that is not the leader, and they want to leave the union, it needs to be approved by the leading alliance. You get me so far? It's it's very much Hotel California. You can, you can leave, but you're not getting out. Now, let's say you do want to leave, and the leader says no, what is going to happen there? Well, you will get a CB. And that CB basically says you can go to war with the Alliance or the Federation and fight your way out. But there's probably better ways of dealing with this. But we'll, we'll go into the laws shortly. It's only possible to start by autocratic societies because we got to suppress those trillions of, of slaves. 
But yeah, I, I really hope that we're going to see the Feudal Society perk being merged into this. The Feudal Society perk, I've done a video about this in the past, is one of the things that I really would really like. The idea of having a society with vassals, similar to what we would have in Crusader Kings, and that's not the last time you're going to hear that sentence in this video, by the way, is... It's so cool. Like Dune is all about the aristocr aristocracy houses and the families controlling space somewhere out there. And the feudal society civic on paper sounds so cool, but in reality is so incredibly unpractical. But I think the hegemony will allow to add a little bit more flavor into that. And I think that is a very cool little adjustment, potentially, if it happens. Let's, let's put it this way. Now, all these federations, they can get new perks over time by leveling up. Yeah, it's it's actually called leveling up. It's I feel it's a little bit of a weird name to call it that. I would have personally gone for, like, integration or development, but I guess here we are. Now, leveling is done using the federation's cohesion system. Now, if you go into your empire screen, on the bottom left, there is a cohesion modifier. All right, you've seen it. Good. Ignore it. It's got nothing to do with this. Okay, so what is cohesion? Cohesion is a system that calculates how much experience your federation gets every single month and then apply that to your progress bar. It sounds super gamey. I'm pretty sure it's going to change at some point, but like I mentioned, here we are. So how is this impacted? Well, for instance, ethics divergence. If you have a lot of members in your federations that are completely different from the core ethics of your founding members, so to speak, then your cohesion is going to go down. And now this is a very good time to remember that there is the ideology war CB. So before you let anybody in, you probably want to press your ideology on another nation and then invite them, just to keep that ethics, you know, out on the same level. You kind of also want to do some ethics um, divergence modifier, and make sure that is not really a problem. So make sure that you've got those uh, deep space black sites everywhere. That one's going to be important. Uh, you can deploy envoys. Yes, embassies are effectively back. Zero, zero, embassy propose. Oh boy, it's, it's going to be back. So if you send an envoy to another empire, cohesion goes up, you get more XP, etc. Now, if you have a new member, join the alliance, the cohesion will negatively be impacted as well. So that's something you want to keep your eye out. And every single piece of cohesion will allow alliance generation uh, experience generation to go up. Now, there are, apparently are a bunch of temporary modifiers, and it's not very clear what those are. I'm sure we'll see those in the future. If not, I'll have to make a video for it when during pre-release. But still, it's 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 really cool to see this, even though I'm not particularly keen on the name. Now, cohesion, it ticks up or down. Yes, you can also go into the negative by a maximum or minimum of 100 per month, and you will need to keep that number as high as possible, again, so you can get enough, enough experience experience for those juicy, juicy level bonuses. Now you ask me, A-Spec, level bonuses, what, what, what are we talking here? Well, when an alliance levels, so there's new, and every time an alliance levels, there are new perks unlocked. Now there's usually three perks, actually there's always three perks. Anyway, two of those perks are for your alliance members, and you get an extra one plus the original two for the Alliance leader. So it actually helps if you are the Alliance leader of a, of, a, of a big federation because you will get more bonuses. Now this can range from improved resource production uh, from specialists or just na normal workers or uh, even higher up on the chain with the leadership pops and that sort of thing. Uh, additional envoys for federation leaders and every single Alliance type like, has different bonuses that are tailored specifically to them. So let's say a research cooperative gets science bonuses, whereas a uh, trade league generating trade value, military to fleet power, etc. So there's actually quite a lot of variation there. Kind of think tradition trees, except for federations. Which is kind of interesting. Now there's five levels in total in terms of the Federation levels and each have their own bonuses. Again, it's not clear what those bonuses actually are. There's quite a lot of dev art here. So don't worry too much about that. It's going to be added over time. And even then, if I had access to any of the builds right now, uh, final numbers would definitely not be 
final. So yeah, there there is that. Now it's going to take you a lot of cohesion and time to get to a level 5 powerhouse alliance. And yes, you can definitely lose XP, which means you will level down if an alliance isn't cohesive enough. So this is a nice simulation of the rise and fall of empires and anything in between. Now any alliance will be managed by an overarching set of laws uh, that will start on a certain default. So when a certain alliance type is formed, it will have a certain default set of laws. You don't just start out with zero and then you get to select your laws. Now you'll have your previously defined codified laws based on the type of alliance and you can change them over time. Now certain alliances cannot have certain laws. A research cooperative cannot allow you to give the maximum amount of fleet bonuses because they are all about the science. They don't care about fleets. They go towards the military alliance like next door if you want that sort of thing. A lot of these laws are also locked behind federation level. So you will need to have a very high level of federation so that you can do a new thing called federation centralization. Where have we seen this before? I'm looking at you here, Crusader Kings. Uh, and then you will be allowed to unlock more uh, laws that you can use within your federation. So I'll give you an example here. Like I said, fleet contribution cannot be maxed out by a research cooperative. Uh, you're not stuck with any laws and that sort of thing. You can always change them and they're voted on within the alliance. Or if you're the hegemon, you can probably just force them through. Now, laws are things that dictate things like succession of alliance leadership. Yes, there are laws for this. It is usually based on the strongest member, as it is right now in federations. Either their diplomatic weight, which is a separate system for a, dip or a different death diary. We'll talk about that at some point in the future. Whether or not it's on a rotation basis. And my personal favorite, a challenge from another member. And uh, this one, there's a special option for psionics, which can uh, fight using mind bullets. And if they lose, they get sent into the Shadow Realm. So uh, get your Yu-Gi-Oh skills ready because uh, we're going to send some dudes to the Shadow Realm who try to um, not respect our authority. Now for non psionic members, there's an arena that you can fight in between leaders. I think about the dual mechanics, again, from Crusader Kings 2. Seeing a pattern here? I hope you are. There seems to be quite a lot of cross-pollination there. Uh, there's also laws about how long a ruling term is, how wars are declared, how new members are invited, whether or not there's free migration between the empires or external with the empires. If empires are allowed their own separate treaties with externals. If you're in the European Union, you ain't making any treaties with anybody else. The EU will do that for you. Oh yes, that's something you can uh, do as well. Uh, centralization, we already talked about that, and the entire system... Uh, it, it feels very similar to the Crown Authority system of Crusader Kings 2. I have said that word several times so far during this video, but I think it's very, uh, very applicable in this particular situation because it, it, doing laws is difficult. I don't like the UI all that much. I think it's a little bit clunky, but still it's, it's an interesting way of, of looking at things. Uh, there, there, there seems to be quite a lot of cross-pollination going on between the teams. Now, overall, federations by themselves seem like a very interesting expansion. You'll probably be forced to play in a federation pretty much all the time. There is no reason to ignore these bonuses. My lord, that federation bonus for the uh, trade unions? My lord, that is so, so powerful. I want to get my hands on one of those. That's... That's just too good. Uh, some of these other ones as well, you, you literally cannot leave some of these um, uh, these uh, modifiers is lying around. Uh, joining up in a federation with a different species is totally viable, and you should probably do it. Unless, of course, you're a fanatic purifier or a devouring swarm, and you just want to om nom nom your way through the galaxy. But yeah, I'm, uh, I'm really, really curious how all of this is going to work in the end it, it's definitely a very a large part of the expansion the federations themselves is almost like the the, the expansion it's, is named after this system my god do i think it's gonna have as much impact as origins no 
Do I think it's going to be as good as the Galactic Community? Possibly. Uh, we'll see about that next week when we're going to be talking about the Galactic Community. But if you have any feedback on this particular um, you know, content, as well as this Def Diary, feel free to give your comment below. I'm really looking forward to discuss Federation with you. What kind of Federation do you want to play in, or which Federation are you missing? I know what, what, I, what I'm missing. I'm missing the Galactic Church. Where are my cults? Morgord? I know you're not watching, but I know some of the people that team on. Where's my space religion, damn it? I need to I need to found the holy church of the stars. The prophets demand it. Anyway, I'm gonna go wrap it up here. I hope you enjoyed this video. I actually had a script this time around. I feel, hope it felt a little bit more cohesive than normal. But anyway, thank you so much for watching. And until next time, take good care of yourselves. And as always, build federations. Because my god, trade value is gonna be so good.